The idea of this video is to let you know what you can expect from the scientific computing course. So let me just jump straight to the bottom line. There'll be two ticks and they'll both be about modeling the COVID epidemic. In tick one, you'll program a simulator and you'll figure out how vaccination levels and our number and herd immunity all, all work together. And in tick two, you'll do data analysis and you'll look at how the waves of COVID have played out in different countries. All of this work comes under the heading of scientific computing, which means computing as a tool for doing science, as opposed to computer science, which is the scientific study of computation. Let's think more about how science works so that we understand better the difference between these two. Scientists try to build up an understanding of the world. They're always inventing models and explanations and testing them and elaborating in them or discarding them and trying something else until they come up with a model that they're satisfied with. It's iterative, it's got lots of dead ends and you don't know where your investigations will lead you. And at the end, you should have learnt something and you can share your understanding. So what sort of computing tools do we need when we're doing science? We need tools that let us code at the speed of thought. When we're exploring a data set or trying out machine learning ideas or testing a simulator, we have umpteen possibilities buzzing around inside our heads and we need to be able to implement them quickly and easily. We want to get from ideas to output with as little typing as possible. We want to explore as much territory as we can, as fast as we can. This calls for code which is mainly one or two liners, one-off code because it's new code for every idea we have. And it means we need to use libraries that are rich and expressive, libraries that let us do an awful lot with just a few lines of code. And this generally means libraries where there's a lot to learn about how they work. And it means that the code we do write is mostly massaging our data so we can feed it into or out of those libraries. In other words, our code will be glue code tying together library routines. And that is what this course is designed to teach you about. The nitty gritty of the libraries that everyone uses for data science and machine learning. Here's what the course actually consists of. The first section is a very rapid run through of Python. You're all computer scientists and you all know how to code and Python is one of the easiest languages to pick up so I suggest you just skim through this section of the course. But do pay particular attention to some of the clever bits of Python, the idioms that let you do a great deal with a minimum of typing. The online tutorial points them out. Then sections 1, 2 and 3 are about three of the cornerstone libraries. NumPy for number crunching, Pandas for handling datasets, and matplotlib for plotting graphs. Please don't come out of this course and go back to plotting graphs in Excel because it will make all the lecturers in the department cry. I've also thrown in an appendix with some recipes for data scraping. If you want to go and do your own scientific computing work, you may want to scrape data from websites and analyze it, and these recipes might come in handy. Now, the teaching material for this is all online tutorials. You can find the tutorials linked to from the course website. You'll be asked to log in with Raven and then you can start. On each page of the tutorial, you can run the code to see what it does. And you should work through any questions it asks you and then continue to the next page. Now, about assessment. First, there is no exam. There are only ticks. There are two ticks, each worth two marks, so you can get a total of four marks. And nearly everyone gets four marks. These are ticks. They're not meant to be great big challenges. I mean for this course to take you about 15 hours of study time in total. And if my estimate is way off, please do let me know. These four marks will be worth a total of 7.7% of the total grade on your maths paper. There's an automated system for checking your answers. I call it the autograder. You have to pass the autograder and submit your notebooks by the 1st of February and then a random selection of you will have live ticks. 
and I'll post instructions about how these live ticks will work closer to the deadline. Here's what the auto grader looks like. There are notebooks for each tick and this is how they'll present the questions. Pause the video and have a quick read. You can do your work in Jupyter Notebooks on hub.cl. There's a link from the course webpage. Log on to hub.cl, start a new notebook, making sure you choose Python 3.9, and answer the question. This question asks you to implement a function. Then, to submit your answer, you use these magic lines of code. Load in the autograder. Configure it to point to the course code and the section code that the tick tells you to use. Then, fetch the question parameters. This will return a question object with parameters for you to feed into your function. Compute your answer, submit it, and it'll tell you correct. If your answer was wrong, it'll tell you what bit of it was wrong, and then you should go and fetch new question parameters and try again. You can also check your progress. There's a page you see when you load in the autograder, and if you click through, it will tell you which questions you have answered. This autograder, by the way, you can run it wherever you like. It's probably easiest to use it on hub.cl, but some people like Google Collaboratory, and some people like to use Visual Studio Code on their own machines. Personally, I always would do this sort of work on my own machine, because cloud services always fail you just before the deadline. It's up to you, whatever you prefer. And finally, help and support. You can work on this over the Christmas holiday. The idea is that if your younger brother or sister is bugging you, or if you're being given all the washing up to do, you can escape by saying, I have important coursework to do. Since everyone will work at different times, there aren't any scheduled live help sessions over the Christmas holiday. So just ask questions on the Moodle forum, which I will be monitoring all through the holiday. Then, at the beginning of term, the deadline is two weeks after the start of full term, which gives you more time to do the work and to get live help. In some colleges, your director of studies may have lined up a help desk style supervision, and also I will offer some live help desk sessions. And I'll post details about these closer to the beginning of term. OK, so that's what you actually have to do for this course. Now. Let me say a bit about how to do scientific computing well and how it fits in with the rest of computer science. Here's a quote from the Hungarian mathematicians Erdos and Renyi. They're famous for figuring out everything there is to be figured out about random graphs. They said, a mathematician is a device for turning coffee into theorems, which is sort of true. Although apparently all of Erdos's great theorems owe as much to amphetamines as to coffee, but that's beside the point. Anyway, you have the mathematician here, they drink the coffee, out come the theorems. And out comes something else, the inevitable byproduct of too much coffee. Now, let's extend the analogy. Here's a picture of a software engineer, someone who can turn requirements into code. What's the byproduct here? I think it's thought. Computer scientists have the mindset that it's code that's privileged. We're used to thinking of repositories and source files and compilation and so on as if the lines of code that we're churning out are the thing that matters. And that's true for a lot of professional software engineering. You come, you work on a project, you leave behind a code base, and that is your legacy. All the ideas you have along the way, they fade away like mist. Hopefully you've learned something, and it will make you a better person, but all that learning, it's not actually captured anywhere. So that is what's different about scientific computing. For scientific purposes, for data science and investigative machine learning, it's your code that's flushed down the toilet, 
and it's your ideas that are your legacy. And this demands a totally different approach to writing code. It means writing code at the same time that you explore what code you should be writing and it means leaving behind outputs that record your conclusions. And then this is what it leads to, complete unmaintainable nightmare code where no one can figure out what it does, not even you a week later. So what's good practice for avoiding this, for writing nice clean scientific computing code? Here's what you've been taught about good programming style in your OOP classes. Lots of great advice about how to produce wonderful immaculate structured code bases full of best software engineering practice. It's all type systems and compilers and build processes and continuous integration and all that stuff. That's all great advice if you're writing software to run a bank or an airplane. But it fetishizes code over ideas and it's bad advice for scientific computing. In scientific computing, it's not your code that matters, it's your insights. A notebook isn't the right place to create a software artifact, it's the place to take a journey of understanding to put together a line of reasoning. We need to look somewhere else for good practice. This is Marie Kondo, the decluttering guru, and this is what she'd have to say about code. Look at each line of your code and ask yourself, does this spark joy? If not, delete it. This is what your notebooks look like when you're in the middle of the journey in a creative flurry of experimentation. Clutter accumulates because science is all about exploring and trying things out, looking at the output, tweaking your ideas and your code and iterating and refining. But this is what your notebooks should look like at the end when you've decluttered and distilled your thinking into a line of reasoning. You should accumulate code during a work session, but trim it at the end of each session to consolidate the ideas that you've learnt. Your reader should be able to understand your work by reading top to bottom, and your code should all work if run top to bottom. I'm not saying this because you're going to be graded on cleanliness of code, not at all. The grading for this course is based exclusively on your answers. I'm saying this from experience of seeing students who have set traps for themselves by the way they structure their thinking. And of course, from my own bitter experience of doing something and coming back to it a month later to write up and having no clue what it was that I did. Jupyter notebooks are a slippery slope. There aren't any handrails to separate your exploration from your write up. And I don't think it should have handrails because it would just constrain you. It would constrain your investigations. It would constrain the creative stuff. But still, if you want your explorations to count for something afterwards, you have to follow Marie Kondo's decluttering advice. There's just one last remark I want to make about scientific computing and about the ticks. Here's something I've heard from students in the past. My code passed test too, so I thought it was right, but in fact it was buggy, and so it took me ages to debug and pass test three. Your grader sucks. That is a basic misconception about what this course is for. In software engineering, you're given requirements and you have to write code to meet them. But in scientific computing, it's all about you and your discoveries. And this course tries to simulate that experience. So it's your job to write your own tests. In practice, this means you should invent small test cases work out what's meant to happen with pen and paper, and then check that your code gets the answers right. Nature, when she gives you data sets, is full of guile and deceit. And as a data scientist, you need to be always vigilant and always test your assumptions. Don't assume that just because you produce something that looks right, that your code is correct. And don't assume that just because you passed an auto graded question, that your code has no bugs. OK, that's scientific computing. I hope you enjoyed the course. Best wishes and happy Christmas.